the soils, the, um, the, how we access the tools that help us to keep on farming and how we also access funding to help boost our farming business. Um, and I, I want to sort of just draw on the fact that, you know, the uh, floats around, we've got 40 harvests left. Um, and why have we got 40 harvests left? Is it because of our soil health, how we manage our soil, how we, ha how we manage the pest? Is it the sort of way we manage our wildlife? And are we prepared to accept that? Because we're all very passionate farmers. We're all passionate about where we live, how we manage our land and how we bring our, our business forward and sell that to the public. Um, so we can ch change that statistic uh, with the right support and the right knowledge and the right kind of funding. And we have a great panel for you today to talk about those very things. We've got Jenny Phelps from the Farm Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group, who's going to talk to us about the Elms test and trials and the update from uh, that trial and the ongoing success of the trial. Aided with Dan Gera for the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group. He's going to talk us through the mapping and I'm sure so much more. Um, we've got John T from Farm Ed, his farm manager here, who's going to talk to us about um, regenerative agriculture. And um, with Ian Wilkinson, the founder and owner of Farm Ed, we're going to take a walk this afternoon around the farm and look at their rotation um, and also discuss future funding. Uh, for the County of Gloucestershire. But I think more importantly, and why we made this event today was uh, so we could hear from John Davis, Oxford researcher, about shelter belts, uh, the optimum shelter belt, and how that helps us to boost our farming business. Um, Lindsay, unfortunately, can't be with us today because she's developed a bit of a cough <laughs> last night. So but I'm sure John will be able to cover for Lindsay because they're, they're a great partnership and, you know, a, a fountain of knowledge. So let's ask the panel, let's keep the discussion open uh, and let's sort of work towards the transition of our farming future. I'm going to hand you over to John T now and take you through the next part. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Now, I've got to stand here because we're on screen and we're on a Zoom, so I can't move about as much as I normally would. Um, I presume all the zooms are working. Yeah, well, I've I've asked the people on there, but yeah, anyone on the chat, please feel free to put a question in the in the chat box, um, and we will pass it to the speakers as well. Well, thank you. It's great to have people here. We've um, we have been doing one or two small events through the summer and lockdown. Um, we have been allowed up to thirty. I guess we're not allowed 30 from Thursday, and they're still not quite sure, but it's good to have people in the room. Um, who's been to Farm Ed before? Has anyone been here before? One or two, brilliant. But well, great to see some new, new faces. Um, I'm John T, um, I'm the farm manager, not the farm manager, the general manager here, um, overseeing knowledge exchange, all sorts of things. We'll come on to that in a minute. Um, I'm also a farmer at Conigree Farm near North Leach on the Sherbourne Park Estate. Um, uh, organic, regenerative, etc., which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a bit. Um, but it's great to be here. Just COVID housekeeping to start off with. Um, hopefully you've all got your mug. Hang on to it. That's your mug for the day. Although we've probably got some clean ones anyway, if you've given it back already. Uh, toilets are through the back. All the doors are open to the toilets. You don't need to touch anything. Please keep your masks on when moving around, but feel free to take them off when you're sat at two metres. Uh, that's fine. There's loads of hand sanitizer around. Please keep Please keep using it and washing your hands. Uh, there's loads of doors. We'll leave two or three open. You know, keep it nice and airy and the roof's open too. So you couldn't be much safer in an indoor building. Um, if there's a fire, I think there's 13 doors you can head for. Choose, your, choose them. Or there's a fire escape there. So it should all be okay. Um, Farm Ed, what's it all about? It's the new centre for farm and food education um, here at Honeydale Farm. Um, Ian and Selene Wilkinson, Ian's at the back, you probably know Ian from Cotswold Seeds, uh, funded by Cotswold Seeds plus some foundation money and a little bit of leader funding too to get this education building up and running. We're a community interest company, um, so Cotswold Seeds owns the farm effectively or the Honeydale group, but the education work and all the knowledge exchange stuff we're doing here is charitable. So uh, please do link in, um, keep in touch and you know, 
see if we can help you and work with you. Um, what's our mission? Why are we here? We're here to accelerate the transition to regenerative agriculture, regenerative farming and sustainable food systems. We believe it doesn't stop at the farm gate. It starts with the soil all the way through diverse cropping and stocking, etc., to diverse products, diverse enterprises, diverse people, diverse routes to market, short supply chains, linking to community, biodiversity, water, nutrients, everything, and back again. So we're about everything from soil health to gut health and everything in between, which is quite unique. Lots of people are talking about regenerative agriculture, which is you know, min till, zero till, diverse crops, cover crops. But it seems to stop at the farm gate. We must take it further if we're going to have an impact. So that's one of our roles here. So this building is about knowledge exchange around those themes. And that building through there, our farm eat building or the farm ed kitchen is about the gut health bit where we'll be cooking you know, food demonstration, talking about nutritional density of the food that we produce. We'll learn more about that later. How are we going to do that? Well, through knowledge exchange, things like this, education, um, innovation, research. We've got some research trials and things happening here too. We're a venue for hire for you know, people like Flag to bring their farmers here, which is great. Um, and personal development too. So we're working with some young farmers on little enterprises, enterprise stacking and doing things differently. So a big challenge. And there's the farm. You'll see it later on the farm walk. Hopefully the sun will still be out. Glad it's not yesterday. It was pretty heavy rain yesterday. It's only 106 acres here, but that's about average for the UK. It's only slightly smaller than the average farm in the UK. So we're trying to show the importance of small family farms and how we can make a living and how we can make a difference, even at smaller scale. It's not just about big um, corporate agribusinesses. We all have a really important role to play. So really diverse farm. We've got trial plots of things like sandfoin and heritage wheats and lots of herb rich lays in the rotation, which we'll explain a little bit more about when we go on the farm walk. Uh, we've got permanent pasture down the hill, natural flood management scheme, heritage orchard, apiary, and a two and a half, three acre uh, community supported agriculture scheme. So lots going off in the uh, 106 acres. Uh, mob grey sheep at the moment, but hoping to start a micro dairy in the spring. So we'll have some cattle on site, maybe some chickens as well. So we're trying to show how we can build soil, healthy food and all the habitat and all the other stuff that we need to uh, deliver. Who's the audience? Drives my marketing team up the wall. It is everybody. We start with kids. So we're about to launch a schools project in the spring, if we're allowed, with the country trust. So we're going to get into school and bring kids here. Farmers, landowners, growers, agronomists, advisors, and chefs, supply chain people, politicians, policy makers, NGOs, everybody, the local community. We need to bring it all together if we're going to have that impact. So we can't just do farmers and the usual echo chambers. We have to try and link people together. So that's one of our jobs here to bring people together and bang heads. Please do follow us on social media, etc. at Real Farm Ed. There's lots going off, lots of events coming up. It'd be great to have you with us. Regen Ag, what's it all about? Who's, who's, who says or who thinks or who is delivering Regen Ag? Who are you, which, were, which of you are regenerative farmers in the room? <laughs> Hopefully all of you, Charles. <laughs> Hopefully all of us are in some way. But what does it mean? We've been bandying this term around now for maybe 10, 15 years. A lot of it came out of America, Australia, but to New Zealand, but Canada, conservation agriculture out of Africa. And we've been fiddling with it for 10 years. Is it min till, is it zero till? Is that all, is that all it is it about? No, it's much more than that. But what brings us together as a movement? It's about enhancing and rebuilding our soils, absolutely. But it's about improving, enhancing our nutrient and water cycles. It's about enhancing biodiversity, it's about rebuilding connections to consumers and communities. It's about landscape. So it's more than soil. It definitely starts with soil, but it's bigger than that. And if we get it right, we can lock in carbon. If we get it right, we can have lots of above ground biomass too, not, not just in the soil. If we get it right, we reduce inputs and fossil fuel use. Hopefully improve um, profit by reducing costs and having good yields. And we can improve yields too if we get it right and deliver all those other public goods that the public want. So it could be a win, 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 win if we get it right. 
Um, and it's also good for farmers. If you've read you know, Dirt to Soil, Gabe Brown and all the books, it's about community, it's about family, it's about having maybe a bit more time, it's maybe about getting closer to nature and the soil and the farms that we're managing. Maybe involving more kids and young people too and having a rewarding business, a sustainable business that our kids can come back to or the locals can engage with. So again, it's win, 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 maybe if we get it right. So that's what we're here at FarmEd to do. And how's it linked with agroecology, organics, holistic management? Well, they're all linked together. There's, there's no, there shouldn't be no divide here. The organic management, we learn a lot from organics. Agroecology spans it all. We bring that in together. Holistic management. Well, we've got to think holistically if we're going to make these changes. And there are holistic techniques we can bring into regenerative approaches. So it all links, hopefully, and it all becomes circular. But it's all about based, uh, working with nature, not against it, which is why I'm sure you're all here today, because you're all passionate about working with nature. Um, five key principles. I'm sure you know this, but very quickly, what is Regen Ag? What are the key principles? Number one, minimise soil disturbance. We know that every time we plough and get the cultivator out, we're chewing up and messing around with all that lovely mycorrhiza, carbon disappearing into the atmosphere, maybe some compaction, doing other things too. So yes, we have to try and move to zero till min till where we can. But we've got a problem. How do you get a lovely bed of you know, um, seed bed from a herb rich lay, for example, or a cover crop? We could use a roller crimper like Gay Brown and others in America, but that's tricky. We don't get the frosts anymore. We're not getting the frost to kill that green cover off. We could use glyphosate, but that ain't good for our soil either, maybe. So here at Farm Ed, and we'll talk more when we go for the walk, we still plough. We've got a nice Spanish plough, goes very shallow, three inches if you, if you set it at that. So minimum soil disturbance when we're ploughing, but creates a good seed bed. We believe if you can build that resilience into your soil over a diverse, say an eight year rotation, the soil can cope with a bit of ploughing now and again. So it's not just zero till min till. So it's between a rock and a hard place sometimes, but we've chosen the no glyphosate route. And we'll, Ian will show you lots of wonderful examples of why it works for us here. And of course, every farm is different. Uh, Minimise soil disturbance, well, maybe less chemical intervention. That is soil disturbance at the end of the day. It's improvement, it's cultivation. More perennial crops. Let's try and get away from annuals where we can too in this system. Principle number two, diversity, diversity, diversity. Diverse Lays, diverse arable crops, diverse cover crops, diverse rotations. We need that in the system. Not one single ecosystem is a monocrop. We should be dealing with polyculture all the time, taking risks, doing crazy things, and you'll see some very diverse crops as you go on your farm walk. And that includes things like companion cropping, vetches, etc., under sowing, and doing things very differently. And I'm sure you're all using herb rich lays from Cotswold Seeds, so I don't need to tell you all about that. But we will when we go on the farm. <clears throat> Principle three, keep the soil covered. Hopefully you've got um, your wheat and barley in. There shouldn't be any bare earth at this time of year, even if you've had, got some maize in the ground that came off. Hopefully there's a, something green growing now, or it was under so. Any brown soil left disappearing or coming down the hill. The rain yesterday, we saw it coming down the hills into the water, um, always try and keep it covered, whether it's under sowing or more cover crops or whatever. Livestock are crucial. Um, yes, we need more livestock in the system. Looking out that window, there's not enough livestock in that arable rotation. If we're having an eight year rotation, let's say, or a nice six, seven year organic rotation with grass and herb rich lays and cover crops and retches, vetches and rye, what are we gonna do with it? Let's have more animals outside, grazing it, turning it into protein. The sun shines, it rains, green stuff grows, yet you utilize it. Spreading muck around, nutrient, um, spreading nutrients around, improving soil. And if we get it right, building soil organic matter. Feeding the soil with those soil exudates. This is crucial. Seeking living roots all year. You know if you overgraze, the roots contract. Okay, so we need to keep those healthy roots all the way through the season if we can by not overgrazing etc and feeding those roots so they've got a chance of surviving through February March and then they take off as quick as they can 
and they lock on, the mycorrhizae are all functioning. Um, so yeah, we can do that through mulching and bale grazing and spreading that muck around through mud grazing just to keep those roots in good health. They're the five key principles that I always throw just a few extras in. This isn't just about small scale uh, traditional dog and stick farmers like me with my traditional Herefords and Cotswold sheep at Conigree. It can be about ag tech too. Nice new drills and sensors and remote sensing and drones and analysis. We need that data to make better decisions. So it can be exciting for those young ag tech farmers too. Enterprise stacking, let's move away from wheat, barley, oilseed, rape, maybe a bit of grass. Let's get those mob grazed sheep, cattle, pigs out there. Let's get pastured poultry moving around. Where's the bees and all the other crops and the other things we could be doing on our farms? Again, polyculture and diversity is key. And in that way, we can, Darwin knew this. If you had more diversity, you over yield. Your profits can go up. It's complex though. Therefore, it's kind of up here. It takes some management and some different mindsets and skills, but we can do it. And by stacking enterprises, you more opportunities for young farmers and for your kids to come back to the farm, maybe with 100 chickens or 50 pigs or 12 cows or a flock of 150 sheep. There's a business there, maybe a micro dairy moving around. And that's key. Then back to rural economy and skills and jobs and family. Shorter supply chains are crucial. Why are we producing all this commodity at 100 pound a ton? Let's utilize it locally. Maybe Brexit might help a little bit. Maybe COVID might help this a little bit long term. We're kind of seeing it, but we must make more of what we've got. Maybe bioregional diets. Of course, people want lower carbon diets. Plant based, yes, but meat and other crops too can be low carbon if we get it right but we need the data and the labeling to make that happen. Um, and that's where data and FWAG and things like car Farm Carbon Toolkit and all the other tools that are out there, they're not perfect. And we're all playing with them a little bit, trying to work out what metrics to use, but they are out there and we need to start embracing them. Hopefully the future will be regenerative. Hopefully it's about land sharing. I'm sure you've come across that term. We can do so much with every acre, so much more, through diversity and mindset and not land sparing, which is what George Monbiot would like to see. Plant trees here, grow some plant-based stuff there. I think we can do better than that, but we need to show it. We need the data. Rewilding, yep. I think we could all do a bit more. I think there's some wonderful opportunities to do some wilding stroke rewilding. Even this farm, we're letting a few bits go. I'm letting about seven hectares go on my farm because it wants to, you know, scrub is encroaching, trees are growing, there's some wet ground, let it do what it wants, leave that space for nature. Let's do some at big scale, link one or two bits together, if the farming community wants it, and that's key. It shouldn't be pushed on people, but there's hopefully some space for rewilding, straight wilding. I'll stop there with that quote, have a read of that, and I think that's crucial. This is about bottom up, doesn't matter what common agricultural policy or the British agricultural policy, or what the Ag Bill is saying or what is happening at top level. This is about bottom up farmers actually doing stuff, and making a difference. We can do it despite policy. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? I'll stop there and uh, talk more a little bit later. Hopefully just set the scene a little. <laughs> Question? Yeah. Mindset. We know we can do it. There are people doing it, and that's why getting people together, farmer to farmer peer learning, facilitation, seeing it, trying things, going through that learning curve of failure. And not every farm will be bright, green and beautiful and look perfect. So it's all up here. Um, the more evidence as well. They're the two. Mindset and evidence. Yeah. And, th and mentoring. People need a bit of hand-holding through this too. <laughs> Give you three. <laughs> Charles. 
what scale of what's going on under this sort of umbrella in the UK at the moment? As in, as in land mass or the size of farm? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, it's massive. When I came across Regag about 10 years ago, I didn't think it would take off. Then I did my Nuffield scholarship and I thought, no, this has got to be the future. Sustainability, conservation is kind of old hat and corrupted. And I thought I was alone. And then all of a sudden, Oxford Real Farming Conference, big, the Groundswell Conference, big farmers. It's not just people like us. It's the big boys now and girls taking it on and leading it. And that's the exciting thing. Everywhere you look now on Twitter, on all the farming forums, they're all talking Regen Ag. There's even regenerative farm management posts being advertised in Farmers Weekly. <laughs> so when, when that happens, you know that yeah, we've missed the wave. It's too late. <laughs> but it's happening. And the buzz is incredible. What Regen means, though, and how you monitor and measure it is the next tricky thing. You've got big corporations too. So General Mills in America want all their producers to be regenerative. So your Cheerios will be regenerative by next year, hopefully. So it's happening, bottom up, but also big scale. Dan. It's clear that livestock are quite important to the system. What do you say to farmers that don't want to take care of livestock themselves? Work with a new entrant. You know, get someone in. There's, there's electric fencing, a battery, 12 cows, you're in business. So I think there's more and more. We know people that want to graze and we know farmers that want graziers. So somehow between us, and maybe with FRAG, we need to bring people together. Hi, Matthew. Tell me about connecting new entries and explaining that we've all got our own networks, we've got our own tax or whatever. Yeah. But actually, I won't necessarily know someone who wants to keep bees in the ground. Yeah. wants to put some bee boxes and some plant paper. How do you suggest, or how is that, how are those networks best formed? How are they being formed? How, how am I missing out on them? Or what else is missing out on them? Yeah. Um, I think there's lots of informal networks. There's one or two formal ones, but I think it's up to groups like FWAG and ourselves a little bit, just to bring people together. You've got a wonderful you know, group of facilitated farmers here, and I don't know how many people are on your list, but by talking, and you're, for, you're past your Fed Livestock Association, that forum, that Google forum, Put it out there, you know, looking for a grazier or whatever, or a beekeeper, you'll get 20 people tomorrow. Same with, um, we'll talk about it when we go for the farm walk. There's a move from agriculture to horticulture, a real desire to grow more fresh produce. And we'll see the CSA scheme here. And I've got a two and a half acre market garden on my farm, a joint venture with a grower. I know at least 10 farmers around here who also want a market garden. I know about 10 people that want to grow as well. So our job is to try and bring people together and help them through that next step. So yeah, I think a bit for, I think we can do more, Jen, bringing people together. <laughs> Any more? I'm around all day and I'll be speaking a bit later too, so grab me later. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, of course. Right, good morning everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk again. Um, I, I've got the unenviable task of trying to update you of what's happening in policy and government. And it, it is, um, I'll try and be really positive. Um, and I'm going to show you, what I'm going to show you is actually um, not government policy, because I'm not technically supposed to share it with you unless you are part of the FWAG circle. So I'm showing this to you sort of semi-confidentially in the way that we are allowed to share with FWAG so, and FWAG supporters. Um, but there's a complex picture to try and explain to you about what's happening now and why I task myself with a policy element of this because I can really see that it's an opportunity for supporting all the brilliant things that John T has just brilliantly outlined and that there is a risk of policy getting it wrong and we're on a cusp 
at the moment. And I'd like to explain to you why I think our trial is so important and that the endeavours that we've put in to communicating at length with everyone in DEFRA. So um, to give you an idea, this is the, what we're called the DEFRA Elms puzzle. And can I say, as I say, that, uh, uh, reiterate that what I'm going to show you is, is, is not government policy, but it's the, the most up-to-date policy that we've seen from yesterday. And it's really complicated because each of these pieces of the puzzle that is going to be designing ELMS, the new environmental land management scheme, has a very um, set of brilliant young policymakers and, and experienced policymakers trying to crack individual pieces of this uh, ELMS jigsaw. So I'll explain the timeline in a minute. But it's really complicated um, in the sense that you have lots of different people who think what ELM should pay for and what it could pay for and how what mechanisms would enable it to be paid for and as you'll see coming on board this is the bit that we feel is critical to guide the government on at the moment because you'll see later on from later slides that actually what ELMS will pay for is the whole top of the arching um, sort of like waterfall from which its success will flow. So as I say that the payment rates is, is the key thing that we'll talk about. Social prioritization and local engagement, I'm actually presenting on a, on a um, DEFRA call this afternoon around that, a huge amount of work around data, data analysis, you know, the strategic priority. What will they pay for? What will they want you to do as farmers? Um, oh, and how will that be disseminated? And some of that you may have seen already, which I'll go on to. Um, who, who's eligible? Is it just farmers? Is it people who have green spaces? Um, how will we get people to work together? Have we got existing uh, method of, methods of doing that, like facilitation funds? Um, is there a way that we could actually leave in more money? Is there a way that we could actually uh, facilitate, which is what we've been trying to do, a cross-government investment in natural capital for a climate response to build resilience both on farms and in communities? Um, who do we need to help us to do that? Because it's complex, and we want to, so we've been demonstrating that through our trial. And then what came out yesterday was this enormous vehicle around monitoring and evaluation around they want to sort of analyze what if they move pieces of this jigsaw and, and, and take pieces and change them, how, how will that affect the outcome? And obviously in supporting projects, I think, are our, are our tests and trials um, and this, this modeling and impact assessment. So going on to you've probably seen this uh, through other mechanisms, which is basically where it's trying to give a timeline of what is happening over the transition and we've been really raising um, the awareness I think within government if it's fair to say about the fact that this is a critical time it's like a perfect storm a lot of farmers have experienced poor harvests they're anxious about BPS reductions next year um, that there's obviously COVID might be impacting on your uh, diversifications and obviously we've got trade and Brexit and what we've seen is that there is an understanding within government that that is a critical time, um, but they really need to act now. And this is something that we were talking, I was talking last week to um, program managers and DEFRA directors about the fact that could there be some emergency funding that comes out to pick up farmers who might be in a critical position over the next year? Because actually, if you can see the sustainable farming incentive scheme, which is where they're sort of talking about actually picking up um, funding that has come from basic payment scheme reductions being recycled into the uh, sustainable farm incentive scheme isn't going to happen until 2022 and what we're suggesting is is that could they either bring that forward or could they um, could they enable that to be something that has, there's a that there's something in that gap uh, to help farmers that might be feeling quite overwhelmed at the moment with the impact the other thing that we've raised with them is is that some of the suggestions that they've made is that, that they a lot of people go into countryside stewardship as some form of way of mitigation, BPS loss, and obviously they've committed that that will become available right through to 2024. Um, but the challenge with that is that if you're a, if you're a pastoral farmer in mid-tier, that you may think that actually arable options are more valuable to you, and they're almost creating a, um, a sort of incentive for people to plough up an interest in permanent pasture to get more valuable arable options, and we've raised this very much um, with DEFRA because obviously they don't want that to happen and they are trying to solve some of these issues that we've raised. Um, so there's lots of different there's lots of different scenarios that we're seeing people doing. A lot of people are going over to 
trying to um, do big mid-tier and higher tier agreements. So what's happening to our food production? Um, some people are investing, being really brave and investing huge amounts of money to try and take it on the chin and show that farming can respond to these complex times. And some people you know, are worrying about whether or not they're going to give up and do something else instead. So um, what we're trying to offer through our relationship with DEFRA is some real ground truthing of what the impacts, the unknown unknowns are by creating policy that is uh, complex <laughs> and actually um, really um, understanding that there's a risk if you have lots of different government departments in different areas that there might be some gaps that you miss that might have some quite serious consequences. So our vision for trying to support and promote ELM is really to support this regenerative vision that John T was sort of like uh, so eloquently describing, because um, it can be something that can really be designed well to be able to support farmers so that they can enable a risk of rewilding, they can get rewarded for building soil that also produces food. And I'm just going to show you a couple of really quite complex slides, but to give you an idea of the complexity of the design of thinking of ELM within DEFRA. Uh, and again, this is not government policy, this is just the latest form that they're sort of working on, is, is that it's this, this, this huge wheel of opportunity to create a scheme that could support um, that sort of vision that we've all got about regenerative agriculture and relocalization and climate response and rewilding and nature recovery and his social inclusion and you know food equality um, or if they get it wrong based on, on getting the payments wrong and they don't get the uptake and they don't create the right drivers then none of that vision will be so easily realized we could have a ground up revolution indeed and i fully support that but it would hopefully happen quicker if we can do it in a way that is supported by policy so as you'll be aware you'll have heard this quite a lot now that there is you know this idea that you have these three tiers which i'm sure you've heard about before and currently what they're trying to work on is uh, again in different areas as the tier, tier one tier two and tier three are different teams within defra and that tier one is uh, currently discussing what they call the standard which i'll show you on the next slide and there's a lot of debate around um if we have a tier one what does that look like what will it pay for now Sam will explain under our ELMS trial that what we've suggested is that tier one should be for everyone. It should be about verifying a natural capital platform that enables us all to say what we're delivering, how we're delivering it in the context of ecosystem services, including food, and how we can be supported for that and maintain standards and improve standards by working with people like LEAF and Sustainable Food Trust and AHDB. Tier two looks like it's very much going to be around the facilitation fund. And again, we have a vision to continue this um, brilliant way of farmers working together collaboratively across the landscape. Um, because obviously that enables us as a community to, to play our part in a climate response and help communities to become resilient and deliver those outputs and public goods. And the tier three is based really around this idea that there's a lot more to deliver. And we're sort of suggesting you need to get those advisors out there. You need to get people to understand that there is lots of funding from lots of different sources and it's complicated, but we can co-deliver this. We can get natural flood management funding. We get water company funding. We can get, you know, funding from biodiversity net gain. We can actually create a framework where investment enables this recovery to happen. So um, we're still trying to realise potential of those tiers within government and still trying to get them to understand those opportunities but we are making some headway so the introduction of tier one standards as i say i'm not going to touch too much on the detail um, because there isn't exact detail yet as i say this is not government policy um, i'm sure i've said that at least three or four times now um, the but the basically one of the things that the elms engagement group have said is, is that the idea of standards is, is strange language um, and we're not quite sure what that means um, in the sense that the um, standards we're familiar with might come around regulation and might come around you know what what is the, the legal standard whereas this is around a sort of more like a standard of um, of, of um, payments by result type standards so you know what what is it you'll be required to deliver for for that element um, and they're now exploring through this tier one potential design about you know what it what is this what is this sort of metric of 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 what those standards should look like around different elements 
and, and this is all still very much uh, in debate. And um, what the view is, is that the, that the Sustainable Farm Incentive Scheme will be developed and designed for 2022, as we said, slightly late, we fear, but um, that that will merge into what becomes Tier 1. And DEFRA have been telling us very much that this is, this is an ongoing uh, analysis. I'll show you that sort of complex uh, picture at the beginning about how it's very much about this interaction about, oh, did they get it right? Did they not get it right? How can we tweak it? And that's where we all play a role in ground truthing and enabling that to happen. One of the things that they are going to take forward quite soon, sorry, this is quite dry. I'm, it's not as inspiring as John T, but it's because this is, this is really hard stuff, a lot of this. And trust me, I spent hours doing this stuff, which is um, really quite challenging. <laughs> but, uh, but the Elms National Pilot is going to happen apparently next February, subject to, um, you know, obviously changes within COVID. And um, there have been some, some initial um, the guidance given to us about what um, an eligibility for phase one pilots might be and we've already expressed some uh, concerns not meaning to not be supportive we're not trying to constantly criticize we're just trying to constantly raise the issues that might be impacting the real world um, so for example the moment they've suggested that tier one pilot farmers could not be in an existing scheme so they might be farmers that are coming out of a scheme and going into another scheme next year. Um, and actually what they're going to be wanting to pilot is the sort of mechanisms around ELM and that would include financial incentives that are mimicking what ELMs might pay for. Um, so we've asked them about what those payments might look like and will they be, will they be related to um, an, or equivalent to countryside stewardship type um, uh, ag agreements that they could have gone into if they had not gone into the pilot and they're still answers to be had around that. But we've suggested that in Gloucestershire that we um, we run our own pilot, that we actually, I put it to the program manager that, you know, we'd just like to have a go as a community of farmers and communities and partners in Gloucestershire to say, just give us a pilot and we'll give you an idea how it might work in reality. And at the moment they haven't said no. So watch this space, but I wouldn't be dealing with money. I'm not prepared to ask you to put your businesses uh, in, in the hands of, of those sorts of agreements. So the thing that is really complicated at the moment and everything hinges on is payments. Payments, payments. And the reason I put this up here um, is because I want to try and explain to you around why I'm really concerned about the government's um, lack of understanding. And this is, and I'm not meaning to be negative, it's trying to inspire the Treasury to understand that there is a different way to pay for the work to support regenerative farming. And at the moment, for whatever reason, they're stuck on this income for gone plus costs, which is how you've always been paid for agri-environment schemes. So very much in the, in the term that it's taking the value that you would have been able to uh, get from a, from a conventional agricultural system, which we've all said may have hidden costs to the environment or society if done badly, and actually then giving you a payment based on that. So what we've discovered is, is that payment means that if you're an upland farmer and you want to be, you're being asked to plant trees, apparently there's no income loss for you for planting trees, therefore you'll get no money. If you're um, going to actually be asked to reduce the amount of sheep that you have on the uplands, that effectively that you'll only get a small percentage of your, your income of your small, um, your small sheep farm, that effectively means it's not really going to be worth you, it's not going to help your productivity, it's not necessarily going to help the environment that much, and it's actually going to create a lot of drivers for people going out of business. And some people are saying, oh, well, that's great, people go out of business, we can just buy it all up and go into rewilding all over the uplands. But what we think is much more ethical is a system based around payments for ecosystem services. And I just want to, if I can, and I don't know whether Cameron is ready to do this, is I want to try and explain to you what, what we're trying to get the government to understand around, where do we put it? Here. Say stop. Cool. So, um, so income for I've tried to explain, but what we want them to do is to get to understand around um, sort of like if this is the uplands and we know that it's delivering for water quality, um, for flooding. Oh, sorry, <laughs> risky flooding, um, biodiversity, carbon, and all these other things that we know that all of our land can deliver for, but particularly the uplands and well-managed regenerative lowlands as well. 
then the ecosystem services has a value. Now in 2013, the natural ecosystem assessment basically gave huge valuations. You may remember as landowners, there were these figures coming out of Sturt Marshes saying, oh, you know, a hundred million pounds worth of, of ecosystem service value for, for the amount that your land can deliver economically valued for those public goods. So if we're going to be managing land, both upland and lowland, for ecosystem services and through our trial, which Dan will explain, we're creating a mechanism that can do that that's based on science, then what we pay or what, we, what is paid for to the farmer can be a, a huge benefit because we know that the, the economic value is so enormous in reality um, that actually anything that you negotiate here is cost beneficial to the treasury here. So for example, if you paid a thousand pounds a hectare to a farm on the Thames, that's going to stop, you know, Oxford flooding, and that's going to save, you know, a hundred million pounds worth of economic damage, then that's a good deal. So what most of the way that payments have been calculated around this, and there's some work being uh, going on in the Exmoor ambition, is around how do we come to this figure? So we've worked out that obviously there's a cost benefit, a huge cost benefit, so the Treasury should be really happy. And um, what they're doing on the XMR Ambition is they're suggesting that that should be an iterative process and that we as farmers and land managers and advisors can actually say, well, actually, that, that deal works for me. I could actually be part of this partnership. I could do that on my land. And if you gave me maybe a thousand pounds a hectare over 20 years, yes, I'd create wetlands instead of growing maize on the Thames because it would work for me and I can afford to do that. So what I'm doing at the moment is I'm really trying to get the government to understand that this is cost beneficial and that they're not stuck within their three billion pounds, that it's not a rigid pot. But if you then also get your friend the advisor and you can actually enable the farmer, so you can have multiple investments from lots of different areas that can enable co-delivery of all the different ambitions that they want to achieve. Um, both for flooding, for the economy, for post-COVID, and we can relocalize our opportunities back into a system where you can have this conduit of funding from multiple blended finance into natural capital recovery. So all of our all of our um, trial is around trying to excuse my friend, I'm going to move my friend, um, is to try and make this space now. And I've emailed all of the ELMS engagement group and I'm collating all of the science and the papers based around the evidence the government already has around ecosystem service valuations to make the case to Treasury and uh, luckily the, um, the lovely lady who I met the other day, Janet Hughes, who's the programmes director, is the direct link to DEFRA and the Treasury. So we're hopeful. Um, and why that is so important is because ELMS, if you look at the top, this is the sort of like the flow diagram. Um, Again, it's not government policy. Um, <laughs> that basically is trying to say how successful will we be in designing an ELMS program that will deliver all the things that we need to deliver, all the you know the public goods, the resilience, the economic benefits, social inclusion, all the things we want. And it all depends on what we do with our land and the way that we farm our land and what we buy and how we trade and what we all value. And if you look at it, all of the analysis based around uptake. How, what's going to make you want to join and be part of it? It will be based on affordability, really. It's, you know, if you can't afford to join, and I do share Jonty's vision that it is a mindset, but quite a lot of people actually need investment to be able to see how they can get the, the revenue to be able to justify investment. And where does that investment come from? And we know that we can facilitate that from multiple sources to be able to do that. But to me, it's critical for the success of Elm is in that top box, what Elms will pay for. And that is what I'm spending a lot of my time doing at the moment. So just to, I don't, I'm not quite sure when Dan's taking over, but I'll speed up a bit, but I know Lindsay's not here, so hopefully that's okay. But I hope that's of interest to you. Um, also to say that this is part of our trial is to try and make the case for what we've just been describing. So it's not only to create a natural capital investment platform to enable all of that to happen as we described, but to show the essential role of an advisor to enable to uncomplicate and to blend this finance so that we can have this investment. And Daniel's going to carry on now, I think. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'm coming on. Hi everyone, I'm Dan. I think I've met most of you, but I'm helping Jenny and the rest of our 
fabulous team trying to make what DEFRA's ambition is actually work for you guys on the ground. Um, and we've been trialing since, uh, when was it, September 2019, um, looking at ELMS and how, how can we, you know, unpick this complexity for you guys to make sure that you're continuing farming, but in a way that's sustainable and, you know, we can keep going uh, for much longer than predicted at the moment. So yeah, two aims of the trial that Jenny's just touched on. Um, we're trying to develop a natural uh, capital recording methodology and tool. So we partnered up with the Land App. Most of you here, I think, have at least had a go at the Land App. Um, and that's just a nice way of us logging um, what's currently happening on your uh, holding, but also some future land use. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a moment. But also, as Jenny's just said, is demonstrate that real value that the integrated uh, local delivery can bring you as landowners. So the role of the local advisor in blending that finance, as Jenny so eloquently just put. Um, as a framework for our ELMS trial, one thing we really, really were keen from the start is to make sure we have a common platform to work on. And um, what we did uh, kind of serendipitously uh, stumble upon was the UK Habitat mapping system, which is a simple classification that covers the whole of the United Kingdom. So from coast to coast, every piece of land can be classified. One of the major limitations with previous ways of mapping is it's either urban planning or it's either agricultural countryside stewardship or it's either environmental stewardship, this, that. And what we didn't have was this you know, linear approach, which just looks at that one piece of land in one way. And the UK habitat mapping really allowed us to do that. So we can look at previous ways of mapping this wonderful farm, whether they've had a phase one habitat map or their fur mapping uh, or, you know, land cover data by CEH and can translate it into just a one size fits all habitat map called UK habitat. And just for two minutes, I'm going to explain what it is. Um, they've divided the UK into nine distinct habitats on the screen. And the way they classify each of these habitats is looking at the primary vegetation, so grassland, woodlands, etc. but then also geographic context, geology, and hydrology. Um, sorry to those on, this, on the uh, webinar, you probably won't be able to see this slide and maybe the people at the back either, but the, the habitat classification is hierarchical. So depending on your knowledge, you can go further and further in the detail, moving from left to right to classify better, a higher resolution, your habitat. Um, as you work in, so your grassland, for example, is uh, start of just the letter G, which is your grassland, and you go to the next level, which just splits out depending on the soil type. So your acidic, your calcareous, or your neutral, or the fourth category is modified as well. So an enriched grassland, a productive grassland. And you can go more in detail. And this is where we think is really important is because we can then involve local experts, for example, in the same hierarchy as you use as your baseline. So for our ELMS trial, uh, we were mainly focusing on level four and below. So we weren't asking for grassland ecologists to be involved quite yet, but we wanted to give you guys the vehicle um, to have those discussions with a, 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 more, a more expertise. So by putting ELMS, we're pushing for again, we've written open letter to DEFRA, by putting ELMS in a habitat system that other siloed organizations use, such as urban planning, green infrastructure, biodiversity net gain, if we also get agriculture in that same system, you know, we're all talking the same language, we can then hopefully facilitate that blended finance easier. Um, just a nice transition just to show there's, there's other categories going on. And then what else is on uh, the UK habitat system is just another line of data or another bit of information, which is something called a secondary code, which just provides further context and detail about what's happening within that habitat. So under our ELMS trial, we've really gone through this list and added loads more additional codes that make it more fit for purpose for agriculture. So that's everything from your cultivation type, the type of grazing you're using, um, whether or not you use control inputs, et cetera. And therefore what we can do is have a really clean habitat map of your holding, but also on top of that, understand how you're looking after the land. Because as Jenny says, we're moving towards trying to find um, proxies or try to understand how your habitat type and how you're managing it is impacting this ecosystem service that it's providing. So we've basically got quite a, a long list of different codes that you can apply to your habitats. And now our goal, mine and Patrick, who's also on the call, our goal is to try and make it as easy as possible for you to log that information in as little time as possible as well, because we want to have the discussions that we've been speaking about here. You know, how do we move forward? What's your, what's your ideas for your farm over the next 10 years? And we really want to make sure that we're not getting caught up in a bureaucratic system um, that asks for too much. Um, Jenny's already touched on this, but we really wanted to make sure that our trial fit the ambitions of DEFRA. So the tier one, tier two, and tier three system. And just to repeat what that is, tier one is, you know, you're, you're available to all farmers looking at your single holding, looking after your soil, looking after your water. And then tier two and tier three is more 
connecting the landscape. So tier one looks a bit like a facilitation fund where you're landscape uh, you're sharing a landscape character for example and you have a, a joint ambition to try and improve the natural capital and then the tier three is looking at a more national scheme you know restoring peatlands or woodland creation trying to get the uk's woodland up um etc cetera, etc cetera. but what we're really trying to push is that tier one needs to be the catalyst for tier two and tier three if we can get you in a position where you have those discussions it's going to make it easier for everyone who's involved so that's from funders right down to the farmers as well just a quick recap of what we did um, in our phase one. We basically asked two separate groups of people to complete the same guidance documents, which was map their farm, apart from one of them received a handholding from an advisor and the other ones didn't. Um, and just to show you the demonstration part of the role of the advisor, and when we say advisor, this isn't just agricultural advice. It was obviously a bit of technical advice as well, you know, getting through the land app. But the people in the phase one, um, the phase one group, which is on the left hand side of this graph, they are the ones that received the guidance um, and it took them on average to complete our, our trial ELMS application anywhere between five and 12 hours. And that was to get a detailed habitat map of their land um, to understand what they've got in terms of natural capital assets. And then on the right hand side was the phase one control and these were received you know, no incentive other than a guidance and a nice email from myself saying, please try and complete this. Um, and therefore the carrot we believe wasn't quite big enough to get people over that hurdle. We did have a couple of farmers, you can see uh, spent up to 20 hours doing the habitat map, but a lot of them just you know, didn't engage as much as we could. Um, and there was some really good feedback we came from that was either too difficult, there was too many you know, hurdles, as soon as they hit one, they've got better things to be doing than sat trying to fight their way through land up. And that feedback was really key, because as I come on to in a moment, you're, we're trying to now get to a position where a lot of it can be done automatically. And that's because, you know, out there, there's already a whole lot of data about what's happening, you know, on this plot of land or the whole countryside. And can we channel that in a, a concise way to you? Um, Jenny, I didn't realize you were gonna do the whiteboard thing, which is great, um, really like that. But this is kind of just another slide reaffirming what Jenny says, that each habitat has the ability to deliver ecosystem services, everything from food, fiber, carbon storage, et cetera. And our theory then is if we know what habitats you've got, can we derive what services you're providing. So this is from the uh, National Ecosystem Assessment that DEFRA did in 2012, 20, 2013, um, that each of these different habitats using UK habitat mapping has the ability to deliver a whole number of things. However, just looking at the habitats, you can't quite derive what benefit they're providing because you may be comparing two fields of exactly the same habitat and managed in a different way. One of them may, may be overgrazed and the other one's doing that mob grazing that John T spoke about earlier, or you could have two you know, cereal producers that are using completely different machinery and a completely different system. So knowing the habitat isn't enough to derive natural capital value. Excuse me, talk too much. But what else you can have, is those management codes we talked about. So can we start looking at habitat plus management to derive a natural capital system or natural capital valuation? Um, once again, I apologize to those on the, on the Zoom call. And this is just a explanation of one of the mechanisms that could potentially be used. And the economists, for example, seem to quite like this idea and it's called the Oxcam arc methodology. And it's basically that each of your habitats at the moment, you can only see the top of the table, which is your broadleaf woodlands, has the ability to deliver 13 different ecosystem services to varying degrees of, uh, no, has a, to varying degrees of ability. So from with 10 out of 10 being the best and zero out of 10 being the worst. So for example, food provision from woodlands isn't tend to be that great. However, carbon sequestration is. So can we use this type of modeling process, which is automatic um, to derive a value for what your farm has the ability to deliver and plus the management codes, therefore what you're currently delivering as well. So um, those habitat maps that we were talking about just then, really allow us to put your farm into the context of the rest of the UK and potentially start deriving a score about its, uh, its current ability. So I spoke to you earlier about feedback from phase one. One massive, I wouldn't say flaw, one of our learning curves in phase one is we asked every landowner to start from scratch. We didn't provide them with any form of information other than their farm outline, which meant we asked them to, you know, draw every habitat, draw where every bit of scrub is. And it was just like another BPS declaration. So it's no wonder a lot of the phase one controls kind of told us to stuff it and, you know, didn't, didn't actually finish it. But what we have now since then developed is an automatic process that does that. So working with our partners at the Land App and Ordnance Survey and uh, FME, which are a 
uh, GIS uh, platform, we've now made a lot of that process automatic. So just to quickly talk you through our flowchart, um, all you need to do as a landowner is type in your SBI num number now. And what it does is automatically downloads your field parcel data. It automatically generates what you last declared your BPS, so it generates your land cover data. Then it automatically runs that, um, that shape, so the outline of your field through the data of the ordnance survey have on you. So that's where your roads, your tracks are, your scrub. So that improves the detail even more. Then it automatically runs that through the priority habitat inventory. So it looks to see whether any of your holding, for example, is a registered parkland or you know, an ancient woodland. And then what it does is it spits out at number five, a classification system for you to go, yep, yeah, that's right, or no, that's very wrong. So that process now takes about 30 seconds from typing in your SBI to spitting out a UK hub map. And what we're trying to do is get that built into land app. So that's still running off this computer here. Um, so it's still a bit clunky, but you know, the technology's there and we're really quite excited to see it develop. But what that now means is that you can be involved in the, like a meaningful data set by going, okay, this is what they have on my farm at the moment. Is it correct or is it not? A lot of, for example, the hedgerows that will get spat out, I can guarantee will be incorrect. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, inconsistencies with how they map the land and that's where what we're really passionate about is giving you guys the landowners the vehicle to say what's wrong and what's right and contribute to that data set so number six is you as an applicant to elms we're hoping we'll get to confirm and amend that habitat map so this will be the first and only thing you need to do on land app which is either you can print it off and we're going to do some manual paper applications but we really want to give 75 80 percent of you a chance to, you know do it all digitally where you go yeah that's right apart from you know that hedgerow is no longer there and it's here and actually it's so wide now because i've let it regenerate for the last 10 years and i'd say it's you know a thick corridor rather than just a, a line um so step number six is where you really get to contribute to that data set um and then also put just on this arrow, you can also bring in accredited advice as well. So if, for example, you had a grass and ecologist come in last year, you know, you can bring them into your land up account and they can do that further down that hierarchy, which just adds to your data set. So each time this cycles, we're just getting more and more information that's just higher resolution and you're not having to start from scratch. Um, point number seven is the management code. So it's understanding, we've got your habitat map. Yeah, I'm happy with that. That's exactly where my farm, farm buildings are. And you know, there are my solar panels, um, but also we can put in those secondary codes. So how are you managing each of those habitats? This step number seven, we're really gonna look at more in phase three. So after March, we've tried it with, a, I don't think actually anyone here has done any of the management codes with us. Some of the people on the call have, um, but you know, that's, that's the next step is understanding your management, but trying to make it as succinct as possible. And then step eights and nines are an automatic process. Just thought I'd do it for transparency. But basically, um, we've got a data program that looks at your data file that you're submitting, saying this is right, and just make sure it is correct. So there's no, for example, overlapping, you know, you've got a woodland on top of a cropland, or you're not declaring, you know, John next door's field as your own. So there is a process of uh, robustness in that data. And that basically feeds into step number nine, which is just a database. This, you know, county-wide or a national database of which we can run analysis for ecosystem services, you know, flood management, where best to, for example, as Jenny mentioned, you know, how do we best stop Oxford flooding? We can target that. But what this mechanism allows us to do as an agricultural sector is harness the technology that currently we're, we're really not doing using the paper-based system. Um, just to quickly get some uh, visuals on there. So your current land use, you say where your wildflower is, where your wheat is, for example. Um, you've got a nice bit of scrub, which is this bit in, um, purple so that's your baseline map and then we're going to start asking you okay what do you where do you see your farm going in the next five or ten years time can you tell us the future land use that you want to see happening and so using land app we're trying to make these clean crisp maps where i want to put in a bird bird seed cover at the top right here the northwest and also want to plant a new woodland here and also i'm going to do a little min till trial plot here so we're looking at both land use changes but also management changes um, and not to labor the point too much, this data then allows us as advisors and as practitioners, et cetera, to really explore sustainable practice. We understand what you've got, how you're looking after it, you know, how we can help you shift towards more sustainable practice. And it's that repeating baseline where you're not constantly having to start from scratch, just year in, we look at it as an annual submission. Um, what are you currently doing and where do you want to be in the next five years? Do you need any help with that? What are your blockers? 
Um, so that's kind of a quick summary. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jen again, um, just to round off. But any questions either on the chat or here, happy to answer them once Jenny's finished. Just really quickly. So um, thank you for listening to all of that. But I know it's a lot of technical information, um, and I know that it's. Um, it seems sort of like, you know, far, quite far away from the wonderful, you know, soil up approach that, um, that John T was so inspirational about this morning. But it is really important for us, I think, to actually to do this because technology is moving this way. This is the way that, you know, that the world is going. And as, as, as Dan said, that, you know, we need to be able to catch up because if we can get the science behind this, then we can actually get the investment and we can be the enabling. And so this is some of the screenshots of some of the uh, farms that have been kind enough to, um, to do our trial. Obviously, the, the first one here is the, an individual farm map. That's uh, Henry Robinson, Henry and Alex Robinson's habitat map. Um, the second one here is um, the Endscot Trust Farmers. And the thing that really excites me is, is that we now know that we can link all of this into neighbourhood and parish planning. And that's our next objective is to able, enable each community to start to not only work with its farming community along catchments to work out how land can be managed to build food resilience and, and water and flood mitigation and all of that, but we can actually create these action points that we can disseminate through catchment partnerships and local nature partnerships to create coordinated action on the ground. Um, to be able to facilitate that funding. And we're doing a case study just down the road here at Bledington. Uh, the village has invested currently £2,000 of my time and we've already identified over 180,000 quid's worth of funding for them in six weeks as to where they could get co-investment to become more resilient. And they also hope to have a community sports growing adventure uh, as well. So, um, so as I say, just really quickly, that we really believe that that is the role of advisors. Um, it really helps with that uh, in different elements and I won't labour this point now too long because I think we've sort of covered this, but tier one is essential for us to enable all 80,000 farmers across the country to create that platform for investment. Tier two, there's brilliant to see so many groups of farmers coming together to say they want to be in this. Um, and tier three is our, is our passion really, is for them to, the treasury to understand this opportunity for blended finance and building that community resilience um, so that we can all act together at a time of you know, economic challenge um, you know, and the, all the things that, that people are, that are being thrown at them with COVID and, um, and Brexit and poor harvest. And actually, we really believe there is a, a really bright future um, if we can get government to understand the opportunities that we're trying to show together. So thank you. That's, that's everything. <laughs> Oh, hi, Alex. <laughs> hi, Alex. Hi, Jenny. Your farm just showed it on the... <laughs> very, thank you very much for that. I um, can, you're very quiet. I can just about hear you. Yeah. Go on, Alex. Can we hear you? Yeah, can you hear me now? Oh, it's very quiet. I can hear him. Okay, do you want to repeat the question? That okay, go for it. Um, I just wanted to, to ask um, why you wanted to focus on payments for ecosystem services at tiers one, two, and three. I would fully support this for tiers two and three, but, um, but not for, particularly not for, um, for example, carbon offsetting, where uh, I believe that Elms has a risk of competing against, if you like, the, the private market, rather than working together um, in, in order to basically um, in, in heart, enhance um, the, the environment in, in that in that sense so really can elms work better with the with the private market and uh, particularly around around carbon and not compete against it yeah did, did it, could anybody hear that <laughs> well it's a very long question from alex but basically what well, correct me if i'm wrong alex alex asked the question is is that why are we focusing on ecosystem services for tier one and tier two is that you said alex and and how does it inter, interwork and potentially conflict with uh, private carbon investment? Is that what you were, is that a sort of summary of your question? Yeah, yeah, close enough. So yeah. I think that, that, that one of the challenges at the moment is, is that there is a huge amount of, uh, or opportunities, is there's a huge amount of um, investment that people want to do through carbon and carbon trading. And I would suggest that we're not trying to conflict with it. And actually, I think that what, when we've discussed this before, Alex, that my view would be that if we can get carbon to be traded from the functionality of the land 
um, based around its ecosystem service for carbon as well, then surely that, that's better than um, just getting people to plant trees everywhere. And I think that mechanism, one of the things that um, people are working on at the moment is something called the Farm uh, Carbon Code, um, which is uh, one of the people that, I don't know if you know Annie, Lisa and Alex, but it's very much around can we create a, a standard for carbon within soil so that that investment can come in internationally for carbon investments. Um, I think there's more work around this. Uh, it's still a developing market. And I think that where carbon investments come should very much align. And I think that from my perspective, having a common platform enables that to happen. How it will actually interface um, legally with all these different payment mechanisms is still something for, for government to do. And I think there needs to be some regulation around trading as well. Um, but as I say, I, I think you and I will probably try and crack that nut together if that's possible, Alex, because I know this is probably more of your area of expertise than mine. Thank you. Any more? Does anybody have any more questions? Yeah, yeah thanks, Charles. One for Dan and one for you, Jenny, if possible. Dan, on your map, when you've got something, uh, a plot in the field, if we had, I mean, I'm bad on phraseology, but if we have our telephone iPhone and we say we're standing here on a hip that will automatically plot it back in. So we don't have to measure plot sizes. If we do dot, 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 or join the dots and make, make a, 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 a field plot. So, so using mobile apps is still something we haven't quite cracked yet. We've got a good app that we use that can do exactly that. It might come sound next to the mic. Yeah. Um, so we've got, a, yeah, we've got a good app that can record exactly as you've said, so it can stream your location. Is it what you're... Uh, referring to, which is, you know, you walk along a hedgerow and you'd, it'll point, point, uh, plot the points, or the same for like a lapwing plot in the middle of your field, you walk, you walk to each four corners and it exactly. does that. Exactly. So we can do that, but it's a two-stage process because currently the land app, which is that, the map and platform we're using, doesn't work on your smartphone. And the other, the other platform, which is really, really good to about three meters accuracy, you can do. But I think when phase three comes, I think what LandApp are going to do is that exactly that, which instead of complicating it, you just have an application where you can draw shapes on and it will send it straight to your desktop, so straight to your LandApp map, and then you, tell, you say what that shape was referring to in the future. So, for example, you go walk your hedgerows, and then when you get from the back onto the LandApp, you click on it and you go hedgerow. And that's all we need. That's definitely feasible. It really is with the new technologies that are, that are out. Um, the, I suppose the one thing that we need to crack with DEFRA is the accuracy of that, because at the moment your smartphone is nowhere near as accurate as their digital four decimal place meters. But you know, there's definitely, there's definitely scope for that. And we as advisors are already using that. But the moment to roll that out to our farmer members is, you know, really quite time consuming for both involved, but we will be exploring that yet. Yeah, Charles. Yes. Yes. On, on yours, if we go through these sort of schemes, is it going to be guaranteed, if I may, guaranteed that we do not lose agricultural status on the ground in the plantation? Um, I can't say. I really can't say at the moment because I think there has been some discussions around taxation within government, but I don't know. I couldn't say. Um, it's all very much still up in the air and I think that that's that everything is up in the air uh, and I think that it's just a question of trying to sort of keep through and trying to get the support that is needed particularly through transition but changes in taxation Charles I've heard them talked about but but nothing verified in any way well it doesn't if you can value the services that that they then, you know, this is the point. It's just the fact that if you plant trees and they, they're valued for those services that they're giving, whether it's from a, a, a carbon payment or whatever mechanism you use, as long as there's a revenue payment that's associated with that, then there is a, a land value associated with the revenue payment. So what we're trying to get the government to understand is that the revenue payments, whether they come from public, private, third sector investment, 
have to include revenue. Now, I have heard that apparently there's going to be a launch of potentially a massive amount of funding for rewilding. Um, I was having conversations last week with um, Ben Goldsmith and Charlie Burrell and, and various other folk, and, um, which is fantastic. But what it needs to do is to include elements of revenue, because if it's just another capital fund that comes out for us to go and ask farmers to do things on their land without that valuation and a revenue being taken into consideration people won't be able to uptake it if they're the normal working farmer that needs to make a living from the land so this is why we've put so much effort in trying to, to create this baseline so that you will maintain the asset value by land use change and rewilding by having a revenue stream that comes from it okay thank you very much everyone thank you Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> yeah, oh, you're going to? Oh, right. Uh, should we just take a 10 minute break, comfort break, just to refresh, come back in 10 minutes? Sorry, we are running a bit late, but if we can reconvene at half 11, that'd be great. Thank you. something to put my papers on. Okay, so it is in my, um, I saw it here just earlier. I've made about 62 copies of it. Okay, let me just put myself on mute. <laughs> 